Glaucoma can be a scary disease because in most people it starts slowly and painlessly, and many don't know they have it until significant vision loss has already occurred. The good news is that our treatments today are safer and more effective than the past, and our technology has advanced significantly to allow us to diagnose and treat glaucoma before any vision loss has occurred. My name is Ahmad Aref, and I'm an ophthalmologist specializing in cataract and glaucoma surgery in Chicago. Consider subscribing to this channel if you'd like to stay up to date with educational videos related to eye health. When most people hear glaucoma, they think high eye pressure, but there is much more to the condition than high eye pressure, and high eye pressure is not always part of the disease process. High eye pressure is just one of the risk factors for glaucoma, but it does not define the disease. Some people with high eye pressure do not have glaucoma, and we call this ocular hypertension, and some people with eye pressures in the normal range can still have glaucoma, and we call this normal tension glaucoma. Higher eye pressure just increases the chance that someone will develop glaucoma over their lifetime. So if glaucoma is not a disease of high eye pressure, then what is it? Glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve, the main nerve that connects the eye to the brain. There are hundreds of diseases of the optic nerve, but glaucoma has some very characteristic features. This is a photograph of a normal appearing optic nerve. The dark orange component of the optic nerve is composed of healthy nerve bundles that we call the optic nerve rim. The central bright appearing zone of the optic nerve is actually empty space that we call the optic cup. As glaucoma progresses, the nerve rim deteriorates, causing enlargement of the optic cup, a process that we call cupping. This example shows a patient that has suffered a moderate degree of damage from glaucoma. You can see that the optic nerve rim appears thinner and the optic cup has enlarged. This is an example of a patient that has suffered advanced glaucoma. The optic cup now occupies almost the entire optic nerve with just a thin area of optic rim remaining. Glaucoma causes slow deterioration of the optic nerve, and this usually causes peripheral vision loss at first, and then eventually loss of vision in the very center. Once vision has been lost from glaucoma, there's no way to get it back. All we can do is try and preserve the vision that's remaining. And that's why it's so important to diagnose glaucoma as soon as possible. We base our diagnosis of glaucoma on what we call structural and functional testing. Structural testing refers to the physical structure of the optic nerve. The optic nerve can be examined directly in the office, and we can look for signs of glaucoma there. We can also photograph the optic nerve to compare its appearance over time. And we can use computer systems to measure the thickness of nerve fibers that lead into the optic nerve. We can get more information of the optic nerve by using advanced computer methods called optical coherence tomography, or OCT. OCT methods scan the optic nerve and measure the thickness of nerve fibers as they lead into the optic nerve, and then compares the thickness of these nerve fibers to individuals in the same age range without glaucoma. Green and white zones signify normal thickness values compared to individuals of the same age without glaucoma. In this example of an OCT scan, we can see a moderate degree of thinning of the nerve fibers that lead into the optic nerve, and this is signified by yellow and red zones of coloring. Functional testing refers to testing of one's field of vision and judging how much optic nerve function remains. The standard way to do this is by having our patients sit in front of a big bowl while holding onto a remote clicker. This is a standard visual field testing unit where the patient sits in the black stool and rests their chin on the chin rest and looks through a lens at the black target in the center of the bowl. 
Lights will go off in the surrounding parts of the bowl and the patient clicks on a clicker every time they see a light go off. The visual field test usually takes a few minutes per eye and it's normal for someone to have to take a few of these tests just to get the hang of it. Visual field testing generates a report that looks like this, where dark areas are areas where the patient could not see the light stimulus and lighter colored areas are areas where patients could see the light stimulus. This dark area here is a normal blind spot. Overall, this is a normal test result. This is an example of a result that shows a moderate degree of visual field loss from glaucoma. In the lower right hand side, you can see a dark area that represents a zone where the patient could not see light stimuli. This is a more severe case of glaucoma where now the upper and lower parts of the field of vision have been lost. Only the very central part of the field of vision remains. There are two main types of glaucoma, open angle and closed angle. The angle of the eye refers to the space between the outermost layer, the cornea, and the colored part of the eye, the iris. The angle is important because that's where the eye's natural drainage filter, the trabecular meshwork, is located. The angle of the eye can be examined using an office technique called gonioscopy. Gonioscopy is an examination technique where we place a contact lens over the surface of the eye once it has been numbed. Here the gonioscopy lens has been placed and you can see that there's a central contact lens and surrounding that are four mirrors. These mirrors are what allow us to see and examine the drainage network of the eye which sits between the iris and the cornea. If you pay close attention, you can see a brownish grayish stripe that sits right in front of the iris. This is the trabecular meshwork and the part of the eye is responsible for draining fluid. This is a normal example. In closed angle glaucoma types, where the trabecular meshwork is blocked by the iris, the first step is usually to open up the angle so that the trabecular meshwork is no longer blocked. This can be done in a couple of ways. One way to do it would be to remove the eye's natural lens, which sits behind the iris, to make more space in the eye. That involves a surgery, and is essentially the same as cataract surgery. You can check out my video on cataract surgery for more details regarding that technique. Another way to do it would be with a laser procedure performed in the office where a tiny hole is made in the iris to allow it to relax away from the trabecular meshwork. That procedure is called laser iridotomy. This shows a patient that has undergone laser iridotomy. On one side of the iris there, you can see a dark area, which is an opening, almost like an extra pupil. This is where the laser iridotomy was performed in order to allow the iris to relax away from the trabecular meshwork and unblock it in a case of angle closure glaucoma. There are many factors that go into whether laser iridotomy or removal of the lens is the best approach for treating closed angle glaucoma. I'll be covering that topic in a future video. Now what about open angle glaucoma? This is the most common type of glaucoma in the United States. For open angle glaucoma, or for closed angle glaucoma, where the angle has been opened with a procedure, the only proven treatment is to lower the eye pressure. The eye has its own internal pressure system. The eye makes fluid in the front of the eye that then drains through the trabecular meshwork. This is all going on inside the eye and separate from the tears that we produce. We can't feel any of this going on. We can lower the eye's pressure using medicines, typically eye drops, but sometimes pills, laser procedures, or with surgeries. Let's talk about medicines first. Eye drops work by either increasing drainage through the eye's natural drainage system or by decreasing production of fluid by the eye. We have several different types of eye drops available and they're all very effective in lowering eye pressure. Some are dosed once a day and some are dosed two or three times a day. Because they all work differently, they can often be used together to lower eye pressure effectively. 
The other nice thing about eye drops is that they're usually pretty safe with a low chance of side effects in the body. Unfortunately, eye drops are not a perfect solution. The small bottles can be hard to handle and sometimes difficult to get into the eye. Over time, eye drops can also cause irritation of the eye. And probably the biggest problem with eye drops is that it's very difficult to keep up a regular schedule with them. Most patients treated with glaucoma require more than one bottle of medicines to lower eye pressure, and that means putting in eye drops from multiple bottles throughout the day. Pills can lower eye pressure also, but ophthalmologists look at this as a last resort or use them just to buy some time until surgery because they can be associated with more severe side effects in the body. A newer development in the field of glaucoma medical therapy is the availability of sustained release therapy, where the medicines can be delivered into the eye directly instead of as an eye drop. This strategy frees patients up from having to put the eye drops in themselves. Currently, there's only one medication that can be delivered this way, and it requires an office-based procedure. This photograph demonstrates a sustained release implant that has been placed in the eye in the office in order to release medication inside of the eye over time without the need for an eye drop. The field of sustained release glaucoma therapy is developing very quickly, and we're most likely gonna have many more of these options in the next few years. Let's turn our attention to glaucoma lasers. There are many types of lasers available to treat glaucoma. We already talked about laser iridotomy, which helps us unblock the drainage canal in closed angle glaucoma. But what about for the treatment of open angle glaucoma, where the drain is open? There's an effective laser that we can direct at the drain to allow it to drain fluid more efficiently. That is an office-based laser called trabeculoplasty. Sometimes we refer to this procedure by the exact type of laser being used either argon or selective laser. So you may hear the terms argon laser trabeculoplasty or ALT and selective laser trabeculoplasty or SLT being used to describe this. ALT and SLT are both performed in the office and take just a few minutes. There's usually minimal, if any, discomfort involved and there's no restrictions afterwards. ALT and SLT lasers are thought to be effective in about four out of five people. So one out of five people won't respond. In patients that do get a good response to the laser, that response usually starts to go away after about a year or two. So it may have to be repeated. ALT and SLT can work alongside eye drop therapy, or sometimes they can be used instead of eye drops. One common question we get about the laser is whether to use eye drops first or laser first when someone is first diagnosed with glaucoma. There was a recent and very well conducted study that was completed to answer that very question. The LIGHT trial studied treatment of newly diagnosed glaucoma with eye drops first versus laser first by randomly assigning patients to each of these treatments. After three years, more patients in the eye drop group went on to experience rapid visual field loss. And these patients were also more likely to require invasive glaucoma surgery. As a result of this trial, more and more patients with a new diagnosis of glaucoma are being treated with ALT or SLT lasers before eye drops. Many surgical procedures are available for the treatment of glaucoma, and I'll be covering each of these in more detail in future videos. Glaucoma surgeries range from being minimally invasive, a category called microinvasive glaucoma surgery, or MIGS, and more invasive. The less invasive procedures are generally safer, but usually do not lower eye pressure as much as the more invasive procedures that have a longer and more proven track record. One benefit of less invasive MIGS procedures is that they can be easily combined with cataract surgery and be performed through the same incision. So there's not much added risk to these procedures when compared to cataract surgery alone. Common MIG surgeries include the eye stent implant, Cahook dual blade goniotomy, eye tract canaloplasty, hydrus implants, as well as others. A common concept among all of these procedures is that they attempt to work on the eye's natural drainage system 
to rejuvenate and enhance flow of fluid out of the eye. In this example of gonioscopy, we are examining a patient's trabecular meshwork, and we can see two surgical implants which were placed inside the trabecular meshwork to help drain fluid from the eye and into the eye's natural drainage system. These are eye stent implants which were placed at the time of cataract surgery through the same incision that was used to remove the patient's cataract. More invasive glaucoma surgeries bypass the eye's natural drainage network to create a drainage system in order to lower eye pressure. Surgeries in this category include trabeculectomy, glaucoma drainage tube implantation with the Ahmed glaucoma valve or Beervelt shunt, and the newer Zen gel stent. It's not uncommon for more than one glaucoma surgery to be required over one's lifetime. This example shows a patient that has undergone surgery with a glaucoma drainage tube. If you look closely behind the iris, you can see a small silicone tube that helps to drain fluid from the inside of the eye to the outside of the eye. This tube bypasses the eye's natural drainage system in order to lower eye pressure and stabilize glaucoma. The final goal of glaucoma treatment is to maintain vision and to stabilize the optic nerve from undergoing further deterioration over time. We don't yet have a way to reverse the damage from glaucoma, so we're really working and aiming to keep things the same. That can be really hard for patients with glaucoma because treatments require a lot of work and doctor visits, and sometimes it can feel like there's not much that's being done. But it's so important to stay motivated and work with your eye doctor's recommendations because the alternative is losing vision that cannot be brought back. The bright side is that our glaucoma treatments today are better than ever, whether that's with medicines, laser, or with surgery. In the vast majority of cases, we can really stabilize the disease, maintain vision, and prevent blindness. Thank you for watching.